Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast if you're not already. To support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. I'm Andy Milburn. I'm Jason Lyons. I'm Dimitri Contacos. Well, everyone, we are, we, we're we going to have a fairly, uh, fairly succinct rapid fire episode today uh you'll be glad at least to hear the first part of that uh, and and the reason why i say that isn't simply because we're all really really busy people and have to rush off though there is that we are very important people but um but also it's kind of just been uh a, a week of a lot of uh small stories which in, in their aggregate add up we think right <laughs> so t what it with with that lead on, what do you? Oh, hey, uh, to preempt what you were about to say, there was an attack on the U.S. embassy in Beirut this morning, and if this is fake news, I will eat my microphone. Uh, but it's in the Israeli papers and it's on Twitter. Unknown assailant uh, fired uh, shots at the U.S. embassy and was subsequently shot in turn by the. Uh, Lebanese armed forces and uh, arrested. So obviously wasn't wasn't killed, but he's in custody right now. That's all we know, as they say. Um, do you guys know, have you heard anything more on that? I haven't. No, this is news to me. Yeah, once you told us before. Yeah, we should rush to get this out. You know, and because we now we we seem to be graduating right. We uh, from from like a general discussion on current affairs. And now we are breaking news channel rivaling yeah. cable news networks. We should go live. We'll do it. This uh, show's live next time. I think so. Yeah. We've, from we, we've all had some pretty good experience live, right? Steve? Yeah. That's how you, a lot of how fun. You work your way through college. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, a bunch of stuff. Uh, we talked last week about uh, Israel, secretly targeting American lawmakers with the uh, Gaza war influence campaign. Um, not, not just, I'm, I'm sorry. We talked last week, not just about, uh, we talked last week, I'm sorry about the international criminal court, right? Jason, wasn't that right? There, there was a, a news breaking about yeah. uh, former Mossad director. Yeah. Trying to influence. A, yeah. Running an influence campaign against the uh, prosecutor. Yep. Y yeah. And then, you know, this week, uh, secretly targeted American lawmakers uh, with influence. You know, I mean, that doesn't seem like news to me. Of course, mm. Israel is targeting lawmakers. Um, you, Israel has always had a very strong lobby in the United States, and it's it's bipartisan in the, in the fact that it seems to have leverage on both sides of the aisle. Um, so, of course, they're doing that. I don't know why that is hitting the news. Um, and then there's, you know, this latest ceasefire proposal look i I've, I've said this before i think there's there's one really key component of this uh right now and it all comes down to that is that hamas wants a guaranteed ceasefire uh for at least six weeks mm. all right um Preferably, you know, end of war. But I, I believe in the latest offer, it was, you know, guaranteed ceasefires for six weeks, which is actually quite a long time. And the Israelis uh, are saying no, absolutely, because that is that is victory for Hamas. You know, once they once the six week ceasefire starts, now international pressure for negotiations continue. Hamas is still alive, um, and and for Hamas, survival is victory. Right after everything that has happened. Um, so that is the key issue. It's not so much about numbers of hostages released. I think the sad part of this is that, it, look, I, of course, I believe hostages 
that hostages are alive in a significant number. And I, and of course, for what it's worth, absolutely, I believe that everything should be done um, to to release them. But I, I think a sad and cynical part of this is that uh, Hamas will will use this, will use the unknown uh, here, the big unknown as a as leverage. And the big unknown is how many of them are still alive, right? What is the pool uh, for you know that that Hamas can negotiate from? Um, and by the way, you know, I mean, the Israelis are uh, willing to negotiate uh, trade. I mean, um, re recovering bodies of civilians and soldiers is very important to to Israel too. So that doesn't end negotiations, uh, even if a significant number of hostages are are left. Um, a little bit on the negotiations. Alive. You mentioned yeah. like six weeks ceasefires are no go for Israel. I mean, there's no way Hamas releases all the hostages without a complete ceasefire right without a complete like at least total pause of this war going on I, I, I think, why would they why would yeah they? I, I mean absolutely right why 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 would they uh they that's all their leverage gone you know what i mean that's, yeah so if israel's um, if israel's doing uh wasn't isn't a no-go for six weeks and hamas is a no-go for you know, not releasing hostages unless there is an actual full blown ceasefire. Aren't they actually really far apart? They, yeah, I, I, I mean, I believe they are. I, I, you know, it really comes down to look. It really comes down to this. It comes down to uh, Netanyahu, and it comes down to uh, Yawa Sinjar, um, head of Hamas. And and when it, the reason why I say it comes down to Netanyahu is because, you know, with, within the Israeli kind of cabinet, um, Netanyahu is kind of regarded as a first among equals, right? I mean, not him, Netanyahu, but the title of prime minister, so that everything is presented as a cabinet decision, not a single, you know, person. But on the hostage negotiations, Netanyahu is kind of playing it very close to his chest, his own chest. So, um, you know, even his own negotiators reportedly don't know what he is willing to to agree to. And that's, you know, that's the issue right now. Will he agree to this six weeks ceasefire? And if he does, I don't, you know, Hamas has not agreed to release all the hostages. I believe the agreement was for um, 40 hostages to be released uh, if uh, you know, for a six week ceasefire. Um, that's really going to be, that's the question now. The, there is the, there's pressure on the, on the US to, to, to find a resolution. I mean, there always has been, but it's, it's ratcheted up because while all of this has been going on and since uh, the Israeli attack on Rafa almost three weeks ago, uh, aid into Gaza has almost dried up because all, all of the crossings were closed, both uh, Karim Shalom and Rafa crossing, which were the two significant uh, crossings for, for goods. Um, so the situation has, has got worse, not better. And then you add to that this fiasco that occurred uh, when the, you know, the U.S. effort in all of this, um, the, the, the floating pier, all right, joint logistics over the shore, right? <laughs> yeah, joint joint logistics over the shore. J lots, three hundred and twenty million dollars worth of equipment just broke apart when the Mediterranean uh, hit Sea State Three. Um, okay, and and actually, this it, it's supposed to be. Um, I'm sorry, I think it was Sea State Two to Three. Okay, it's the advertised this stuff supposed to the this pier is supposed to remain intact, operable up to, you know, up to including C State Four. Um so you know that's kind of a debacle. Not only that, but from a force protection standpoint, when this thing broke up, an unknown number of US soldiers were left floating around on these pieces of barge and ended up reportedly being washed up on Gaza Beach. I don't know that to be true. Uh, but I've heard it from a number of people. Uh, and so, number one, you know, these are soldiers now with a combat amphibious landing, uh, which is more than any Marine alive has right now, Jason. So we should be worried. Uh, 
<laughs> this, this is an accidental amphibious assault. Yeah. Um, and they secured cars of reach, uh, beach, you know, in these uh, little floating pieces of Higgins boat. <laughs> um, so I guess $320 million was not absolutely wasted, but, uh, being a little cynical, but it broke it all, you know, and that's not the end of the problems. Um, the, the Egyptians closed, uh, the Rafa crossing, um, you know, the Israelis had closed Karam Shalom after a mortar attack. The Egyptians closed Rafa after the Israelis occupied the Philadelphia corridor, which is an area, the strip of land between Gaza and, and Egypt. And so, you know, as I mentioned, um, all of these things were the perfect storm. Sea mm -hmm. State 2 turned out and, and, and the, just halting the flow of aid into Gaza, which is ratcheting up the pressure, of course, on the US government uh, to find a solution. And every, all eyes right now are on Netanyahu uh, because the, the ball is in, you know, the ball is in his court right now. Uh, to see if, yes, he, indeed, he will agree to a six-week ceasefire. And that's why there have been these massive demonstrations in Tel Aviv um, against, you know, to, to stop the war. These have nothing to do with kind of national concern about the damage inflicted on Gaza. They have everything to do with concern for the hostages and the feeling that Netanyahu is willing to sacrifice them for his own political career. I mean, and you got to assume if he does make a deal for the six week ceasefire for 40 hostages, um, right, the guys right to Netanyahu uh, are not going to exactly be fucking, uh, you know, skipping for joy. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've mentioned before, I mean, everyone talks about uh, Smoldrich and um, Ben Gavir, who is two right wing cabinet ministers, but, you know, Netanyahu has a base. A, 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 in the right wing, that's that's wider than that. Uh, there are other ministers in minor positions, uh, but the point is that he owes uh, survival in the coalition to support from um, the two the, from two parties that represent, respectively, um, kind of not. I, I don't want to say ultra right wing, but <laughs> extreme extreme right wing, right wing of Likud, far to the right of Likud. Let me put it that way. Okay, those are the kind of the settlers, the Judea and Samaria, Samaria are, uh, are, are part of the ancient land of Israel, and the Palestinians should not have a state. And, you know, all the all those um, those views, uh, which, by the way, represent a significant amount of uh, a number of Israelis views, uh, which have morphed in the last two decades. Anyway, they so they, that's kind of his base. Right. Um, so I mentioned, yeah, I'm sorry, ultra right or right wing. And then you have ultra, the ultra orthodox um, who, who, for religious reasons, um, well, would, you know, justify the settlement, West Bank settlements and the fact that there should not be a two state solution. And so you're right. Any, not only any, um, yes, any ceasefire. Any ceasefire agreement to a ceasefire will outrage the right and Netanyahu probably lose Netanyahu the support. It's hard to predict. You know, he right. could hang on, but he knows that his 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 future his days are numbered. And if he, as we mentioned before, if he is uh, thrown out, voted out, or or uh, kind of moved aside in a uh, uh, you know, a, a coalition putsch. Um, that's the wrong term to use. Um, it, it, then he faces criminal charges for corruption. Um, so there's a lot. It's not just his political career. It's his personal career. His freedom is at stake. That's at least what cynics point out. I mean, it's all true. Um, whether those are his motivations is for, well, of course, I mean, it, it seems as though it was so likely these his motivations, which when you think about it is outrageous. And that's why the Israelis, uh, you know, a significant portion of the Israeli population is pissed off. Um, and then you get this, you know, these demonstrations by families of hostages who of course have a huge amount of uh, collective sympathy. In fact, are used repeatedly as the reason for why 
um, the invasion of uh, Gaza took place, you know, not just retribution and prevention, but recovery. Um, and then you see these demonstrations being put down very, very zealously, let me put it that way, some might say brutally, by Ben Gavir's police. When I say Ben Gavir's police, I mean the national police. He is, you know, he's the, the Minister of uh, National Security. Um, and uh, and and so these scenes of of families of hostages um, being you know carted off and beaten um, by cops are outraging a number of Israelis um, who feel that you know they have legitimate concern, and then you get you you're, you're getting a very disturbing uh, trend. I would say in the security forces, we talked about the IDF and we talked about Shin Bet. I'm not, no, I'm I'm not necessarily saying what's happening there is disturbing. Um, arguably what's happening there will save Israel uh, in, in the sense that the increasing amount of resentment towards Netanyahu. But what is worrying is that on the other side, uh, the police force um, and, and reservist battalions are known to be extreme right wing. Um, in fact, there are five units that the U.S. has sanctioned or or, or held in suspension for Leahy betting reasons, um, and uh, and and all of those units are reservist units, and and all of them have a reputation for the for extreme the far right kind of views and and actions. When you think about it. That's a dangerous thing, right? If you have a, a, within a military entire battalions recruited, say, from a certain area or from a certain segment of the population uh, who share the same rather extreme views, and then you put them you put them in a position where they have to provide security in an area um, where, you know, where, where the Palestinians, which is a Palestinian area, um, now you have trouble right you've got people who are sworn to kind of evict and either evict or kill these people and now they're providing security in that area that's you know that that is that's concerning all of that is going on so um to say the idf is homogenous homogenous in its views towards netanyahu would be misleading the generals may be but there are certain segments, certainly of the army, who that that support. And, but listen to the way I'm talking. You know, I'm talking as though this is not any other. I mean, a a third world. I mean, not a third world country, but you know, kind of a banana republic. Looking at a coup, that is what's disturbing to a lot of Israelis too. It's like what happened to what happened to the you know the most transparent democracy in the Middle East. Um, I mean, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 troubling times. And yeah, just to add a little bit more spice to the sauce, uh, New York Times reported that like uh, Netanyahu's supposed to come and address Congress. It was said June thirteenth, but uh, Netanyahu's camp said there wasn't a set date for it. But I mean, you let's say it's in two weeks instead of a week. I mean, he's coming to. You know he's coming to do like a Zelensky speech. At yeah, a joint so thing. Again, I just uh... you lost your earphones. No, I just spilt water all over my computer. Please yeah, so me. I mean that's just going to add a little bit mm -hmm. more flame to the fire. Because you know, for the most part, I don't know how Americans feel. Like I, I'm sure there's, there's polls out there about like what's going on in Israel and Palestine, but you see the demonstrations, you see what's going on. It's not exactly like people are all gung-ho for israel um yeah. i think it's understandably so because they've been a bit yeah. you know they've 10x the belligerence of hamas in my opinion anyway yeah i mean it's it, it's certainly it, it's a tough time not just for israel but also for the united states or for the uh the administration i mean increasingly uh the u.s government is in a bad position you know we talked about um we talked about the fact that 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 fire in in Rafa, right? That it was, you know, it was a GBU thirty nine, right? So the the United States has been pushing Israel to use GBU thirty nine. They are relatively small bombs. Um, I believe it's like 
something like 30 kilograms of, of explosive. Anyway, they, they use specifically to minimize collateral damage. Um, the problem is the Israelis use them in an area just saturated with people, which kind of negates, Yeah, you know, the. Yeah. I mean, yes, you can use them. You can, you, you can uh, shorten the safety parameters on their use uh, because of the amount of explosive, but they still carry explosive. You can't just drop them in the, in the middle of people, which um, uh, appear, you know, I mean, it appears to have been what happened. I know people will quibble with that, but the point is, you know, if a piece of shrapnel hits a tank that causes it, they say, these are all, these aren't just, oh, hey, that shit happens. You guys all know, I know Jason in particular, if if one of us was responsible for this on US operations in a place like Kabul or, uh, or Baghdad, we would be A5, B facing charges, mm -hmm. okay, for Absolutely. just poor fire support planning yep. um and that's the way it is their standards are very different you know the bar is is much much lower um and that is you know i i'm i'm not i'm not commenting on the on the ethics of that i'm just saying that is that's the way it is and i challenge mm -hmm. anyone to to explain that differently and that's why you get events like what happened in rafa and it's disingenuous to the israelis to say hey we were just using that bomb you told us to you know fuck I mean, it's like what what that's like is is shooting, you know, instead of shooting buckshot into a crowd, uh, shooting a five point five six, and then saying, "Hey, I only I only killed one person," you know, instead yeah. of um, a, a ton of others, but you're still shooting it at the crowd. Okay. That, yeah, and D also uh, taught you were at, talking about internal strife in the U.S. as far as Israel goes. Um, I think June fourth, according to Reuters. Uh, the U.S. House of Reps passed legislation to uh, impose sanctions on the ICC, the International Criminal Court, for because of their decision, the, the prosecutor's decision to uh, uh, levy charge arrest warrants against uh, Israeli officials. So it probably won't become law. I think the vote was 247 to 155, and 42 Democrats joined the uh, Republicans um, uh, on backing it. Uh, but it it's just going to widen the schism. So, you know, even if it doesn't become law, just the fact that it was um, pushed forward is uh, it's, it's a big. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I mean, more than likely it's not passing the Senate, no. my guess. Um, yeah. Listen, I'm sure, you know, a lot of those Congress people get a lot of money from some Israeli lobbies and stuff like that. So, mm. or they have districts that are, you know, heavily Jewish or whatever, you know what I mean? And so, I mean, that's just American politics, right? It's yeah, like absolutely. mostly, it's mostly like just, it's more, mostly style, no substance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Another thing we talked about was uh, up north, what's going on with Lebanon. And, yeah. Uh, that, I mean, great. That's, that's a great point. So on Sunday, a Hezbollah drone crashed in Naharia, which is a uh, coastal city. It's, it's like the largest coastal urban conurbation north of uh north of haifa and that is the furthest that a hezbollah drone has penetrated uh israeli air defense you know i've i wrote about this i think i talked about it um about uh three weeks ago there was a, a, a drone attack on um it was an ambush actually on an israeli humvee um and uh it, it resulted in one one dead, several wounded. But interesting thing about it was they hit the Humvee with the cornet, uh, but then followed up with drones to hit the um, kind of the QRF as as it came to you know to to relieve them. And um, it was more than six wounded. I'm sorry, it was just someone will correct me. I think it's like fourteen or more. Um, and uh, and and so I wrote, not pretending to be prescient. Hey, the, this is kind of a dangerous precedent. They're using drones now in conjunction with direct fire weapons and indirect fire. That's the other thing they were using mortars too. You know, this really quite sophisticated combined arms um, attacks. Well, the the one in Naharia, um, the you know, obviously the Israelis aren't going to release how this drone penetrated uh, airspace. Israeli airspace, but it's not the first time 
is this is just the deepest penetration and the fact that um you know they that that it was well it, it got that far does not bode well so let me you know let, let me let me just say this so what they i this is hezbollah is treating northern israel as kind of it's it's battle lab right i mean it it's keeping the fire smoldering um and literally by the way because um also over the weekend hezbollah fired a, a bunch of rockets uh, in addition to other drones and started fires um, that have spread to to a significant part of northern Israel now uh, a lot of and um, threatening uh, one of the largest cities in the north Kiryat Shimona, which is right on the border so so all of this is going on and uh, about 60,000 Israelis cannot live you know at in in the north they cannot return to their homes because of the threat so in israel's from israel's perspective israel's already at war um and uh so my point was yeah hezbollah is trying to keep it things smoldering without crossing that red line which will which will compel israel to to actually launch a ground invasion um but i think that's almost inevitable now I, you know, I just don't see Hezbollah stepping down. And as long as there are 60,000 Israelis who cannot return to their homes, and as long as Hezbollah is still firing rockets, I think um, domestic pressures alone uh, would be enough to compel the government to start a war in Lebanon, perhaps. And and this government needs no prompting. Um, so Andy, least... do you think that would be something that would be forced in conjunction with what's going on in Gaza? Or would it be on to the next one after yeah, uh great great question i i mean i i think the idf is what they'd like to see is this they'd like to see um first of all definitely not uh, a military occupation within gaza we we've spoken about that they've been very direct about that in fact defense minister galant and kind of his ultimatum to Net netanyahu last week just said hey this cannot be an occupation force so the idf wants to be able to count on those troops you know the three brigades or so currently now in in rafa in gaza and so the plan would be hey we got to get to the next stage which is starting a, you know which is providing some alternative security force within gaza we pulled the idf out on the outskirts they've already formed kind of a gaza unit not the gaza division but a gaza ct force mm -hmm. to to conduct intelligence collection and strikes uh, within Gaza, um, so so that's kind of the idea. I think the ideal within the IDS mind with Gaza, we wind it down, we take Rafa, we wind it down, we transition, and then we kick off Lebanon. You know, it's gotcha. the, um, that's the plan at least. Gotcha. And all Which, all while they're smoking IRGC guys in Syria. Yeah, yeah. They uh, sorry, Jason. What were we going to no, say? No, no, no. Yeah. I was just just saying that. Uh, I'm sure that that plan that the IDF has uh, is not in an on Hezbollah's uh, play cards that they would rather probably divide them on two fronts. Yeah. I, in Gaza. I, yeah. It's really, it's really, I mean, this is, you know, I'm just about to say fascinating to watch, which makes me sound very cold blooded, but it, it is because the, the kind of the balance are, I mean, first of all, Nasrallah is virtuoso. Nasir, mm -hmm. uh, Nasrallah is the head of um, what is it? Hezbollah. But he, as you know, he is virtuoso in 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 pushing, you know, pushing, escalating, escalating, mm -hmm. then just pulling back before the red line. You know, he messed up by his own. Interestingly, two thousand and six, um, where Hezbollah kicked off that war after. Uh, you know the second lebanon war after kidnapping uh two israeli soldiers and as Rolla said after that hey I, he made a comment one of the rare times he's admitted a mistake he said yeah mm -hmm. i misjudged he didn't use the term red line but i misjudged that point so um because that was second lebanese war it did wonders for hezbollah from a stratcom perspective mm -hmm. and arguably it was a catalyst for its currently it's it's uh, rearmament at the hands of the Iranians, which is boarded up to this very high capability. But in the immediate aftermath, it seemed like a, a, a disaster of Hezbollah too, um, because of what had happened to yeah. 
to to Lebanon. Mm. So it all. So my point is, yeah, I think I think um, Hezbollah is going to, or Nasrallah is either getting direction to, or on his own volition, is going to all want to avoid out and out war until the time is right. The question is, what does that mean? Yeah. Gotcha. Sorry, D, you were talking about Syria. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, the other piece of news was the Israelis hit uh, another IRGC official in uh, Syria. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, this guy, I, I I don't know much about him and I haven't done you know research on him, but uh, Saeed Abiyar um, just reported as an Iranian uh, advisor um he was killed in aleppo on sunday clearly he's important enough for the israelis to hit him um and he's important enough for the the uh irgc chief uh it's the iranian revolutionary guards chief uh hussein salami yes that is his name um to actually you know to to talk about retrib retribution just for his death a warning you know he warned today uh yeah, it was today that that Israel would pay a price for the for for this guy's death. He was he was an Iranian military advisor, so I'm guessing you know he was probably the rank of general. Um, but I I hadn't heard of him. Not that that means anything. He's dead now, and uh, the point is that the you know the, this war continues in in both the eyes of the Israelis and the Iranians. Mm -hmm. The question for us, of course, is how much we are going to be involved too. We as in the United States, yes, I'm sorry. I know we have an international audience, so we also as in the UK and Greece. You know, <laughs> <I collected. laughs> oh man, was there anything else? I'm trying to remember what we what the rundown was. Uh, I mean, and, and for the audience, like you know, we will shift from Middle East stuff once it's not as uh, spicy because it's 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 like every day is a new thing yeah, going yeah. on there. Um, I'd love to hit on Ukraine and what's going on there. Like, do a deep dive in uh show about that. Maybe bring on a um another expert besides Andy. I I'm not an expert. Yeah, I I yeah, absolutely. We'll bring on someone with uh you know with really current um current views. Yeah, you know, well, I'm happy to say. Uh, a good pivot there. Um, and in the espionage world, it's not as you know, espionage is not as uh sexy now that the uh cold war is over and uh you know we're not we're not in a world war type situation yet or according to some people uh but it still happens so uh germany is feeling the pinch uh they had a gentleman a captain in the procurement um uh side of the german army he was just sentenced to, let's see, three and a half years in prison for uh, spying for Russia. Um, now, it's kind of a little, little bit misleading. This guy, he decided that he wanted to pass information to over to Russia. So he approached the Russian embassy in Berlin and also in Bern. I believe he uh, went to a Russian facility and uh, offered his services. Uh, there's no details on the counterintelligence side of the operation how they caught the guy or uh you know the the uh uh details of that but apparently he was uh shared photographs of munitions uh training systems as well as aircraft technology and he so his quote when he was uh uh in front of the court a guy's 54 years old he said it's the biggest mess i've ever made in my life well no shit understatement of the year um so Oh, he went to the consulate in Bonn, Wait, unprompted. Was, What's was that? He, uh, did he have Russian, was he a dual national or anything? No, no. It says yeah. that, so his defense was that he claimed chronic overwork paired his, his ability to uh, think critically about his actions. He had been influenced by a stream of pro-Russian propaganda and disinformation uh, that he'd be con consuming on TikTok, damn TikTok, and Telegram uh, at the time. And he was also had just joined the far right alternative for Germany, AFD party. Not, uh, I'm not savvy on uh, what they're uh, all about. Um, it just says far right, which could mean anything. Um, and uh, came during a four. It said his. He said that his decision was made during a four day 
uh, period of um, high stress, whatever that means. Um, let's see. It says that that's he a, they, you know that's a really so. There's a number of really kind of worrying things about that. Remember, last time we or, or two episodes ago, we talked about a Russian active measures campaign mm -hmm. that's that supposedly was was ordered by Putin about 18 months ago. And yep. then, you know, we, we talked about um, kind of indications that it was kicking off in Europe with um, attempted sabotage of a German yep. factory recruiting of German Russian dual nationals mm -hmm. to attack US targets in Germany and now recruiting of German military personnel, which is, you know, which is really worrying. And by the way, and uh, you know, I, if we have German listeners, I welcome to to hear that they hear their point of view. Uh, but there is always been a little bit of a disturbing relationship between the Bundeswehr and the historic Wehrmacht, okay, and the, or the, you know, or the you know the German um, special operations units, KSK, and, and their predecessors, uh, not just in the Wehrmacht and yeah. in the. Um, in the SS, um, you know, so you can put that down to, hey, that's just normal units enjoying their, you know, their legacy. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, a lot of, and this has been this has been observed by Western uh, officers from since the eighties. Um, significant part of uh, German officers seem very nostalgic about those times, and so potentially. Uh, you know, the, the, there's kind of a recruiting base there for uh, for for Russians, right? Yeah. Um, the you know a lot of Germans, uh, as you mentioned, the party, the AFD. I forget. It sounds like one of those one of those bug sprays. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, it's been it's been growing in in strength because of um, you know kind of ubiquitous concern, resentment about. Germany's position as home for immigrants, uh, you, you know, Europe's home for immigrants, um, at least Western Europe's, Germany's position as funder of the European Union, um, the feeling simply that German uh, Germany is contributing more to the world than Germany is getting. That is, you know, kind of the root, um, the the root philosophy of um, of German, you know, far right party. They're not talking. They deliberately trying to they do talk about immigration hmm. uh, but they're walking a very fine line they know because of germany's very strict it's particularly strict um anti-defamation i mean uh hate speech hmm. uh, laws but yeah that's that's interesting i'd say watch that space absolutely so d that's about it i think for today yep i think that's nice. it yeah just to add to the bit of like Poland arrested a few guys too, four guys about a week ago or uh, about two weeks ago now uh, for doing the same thing. I mean, basically taking pictures of uh, crossings between the Polish and Ukraine border, like what's going over there, like military equipment and stuff like that. And I guess sharing that with the, uh, the baddies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, when, when you think about it, this is a right time. I mean, as as the war in Ukraine, um, it well, it it devolves into a stalemate, and um, and and there's war fatigue even in Western Europe. Uh, it's absolutely a perfect time for the mm -hmm. Russians to do what one of the things that they do very well, which is you know when I say active measures, uh, I don't just mean disinformation. I mean a, a kind of a a, a campaign, what we call a gray zone campaign, mm. non attributable below the level of armed conflict. Um, speaking of which, you know, there are accusations. The Russians think that we're already doing that in Ukraine. You know, I mean, they so they already believe that they are at war with NATO, and mm. uh, and and of course, you know, by implicate, I mean, and of course, United States, um, and that that all these things. Um, to include attacks on German on U.S. bases and German soil are perfectly justified. I yeah. just was on uh, uh, did an interview with um, uh, I don't know it wasn't Al Jazeera, but it uh, I did see dreadful. Um, Al out of beer. Okay, it's a, a, a Middle Eastern network um, arguing against a um, 
uh, you know, a Russian, a, a Russian think tank, military think tank dude, you know, so obviously a, a government stooge, um, masquerading as an intellectual. But, it, you know, I mean, his, his, his point was this, he really, really clearly believed that NATO, that the strikes um, against Russian forces were being planned and executed uh, by Americans, by NATO. And, you know, that the Israeli, I mean, not the Israelis, the Ukrainians just simply weren't capable of doing this stuff. And mm -hmm. so it was the NATO. I mean, he says this on television. This is Dr. Blah, 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 representing, you know, so clearly that is the party line. Mm -hmm. um, it's remarkable. And then, and then you get a guy like this um, who, who believes in um, and there's probably, look, I mean, the, yes, certainly Ukraine's proxy war. Jack has written about, um, you know, Jack's written about agency operations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, today in the French press, the headline is um, the CIA and the, and the war in Ukraine. Not, not a headline, it's, a, it's like an opinion article. Of the CIA and the war in Ukraine, um, knowing knowing when you've gone too far, really, no, knowing when you've really gone too far, question not. <laughs> so I haven't. Shouldn't he be article. talking about that for like his own French fucking? You know, uh, aren't they sending advisors? Don't get all heated. Don't <laughs> get all heated. I know, but I'm saying, like, hey, what, what kind of dumb man, opinion is that? Like, you, I don't. Are you telling us we can't have an objective conversation about, say, the Greek intelligence service? I mean, that's the best intelligence service in the world. This is known. Yeah. It is. Yeah. By far and away. <laughs> the goat effers. Per your general, <laughs> your, your uh, street general that you always see. All right. Yeah. Now we've oh, devolved. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now we're inside, inside <laughs> our uh, signal chat and the shit we send oh. each other. All right, everyone. Super. Um, I was going to say super sing you super engaging with you again hey please keep uh great you know the great comments coming in even the insults uh really help improve our morale day to day so just keep them coming thank of you of course don't forget to like and subscribe check out andy's book Andy's yeah. Substack, andy's twitter andy's linkedin it's all all the links will be in the description uh patreon.com team house steak knives where yeah they're coming soon um and we had a very spicy episode on the team house the other day with a former Navy SEAL that called out of a lot of other former Navy SEALs. And it's getting a lot of. Really? Blah. Yeah. That's unusual. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. For publicity. Who knew? Uh -huh. Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. Everybody. Bye, everyone.